Hello there, Swarmers! Oh, it's so great to have you back with us. Or if this is your first time, then welcome. It's so awesome that you're here as we all make our way steadily to a more sustainable lifestyle together. Today, we're going to unpack some terms which are getting thrown around more and more these days. So, the carbon market. It came to exist on the back of the Kyoto Protocol. And you can check out our previous piece right here, which will explore this and other environmental protection treaties, protocols, and agreements for a little more context. So, the Kyoto Protocol. Here's a little summary. It was the original international agreement aimed at implementing guidelines for reducing global GHG emissions, that's greenhouse gas. It was adopted in 1997, came to be enforced in 2005, and applied to the commitment period of 2008 to 2012. The developed countries of the world had base national emissions rates determined. Most set the base year to 1990, and then all future emissions targets would be based on the set rate. These numbers would hence set a cap on carbon emissions, unique for each participating nation, and for businesses, the government applies a cap to a whole industry. The cap reduces over time in alignment with the increasingly ambitious emissions goals. The government issues permits to the emitters, which are carbon credits. If a nation or business emits less than their permitted allocation, the non-emitted amount of GHGs can be traded, sold, or kept for future use. If traded or sold, they are part of the cap and trade system. To demonstrate the success of this marketplace, the European Union's emissions trading system, which initially regulated about 50% of emissions primarily from energy providers and large industrial polluters, saved more than 1 billion tons of CO2e from 2008 to 2016. In the United States, California is enjoying a 13% drop in CO2e due to a combination of cap and trade and strong policy. So, how does it work? Okay, company A has a cap of 100 units, but let's say they will exceed this and hit 120 units. If they do, they will be fined and taxed heavily. Company B, on the other hand, which also has a cap of 100 units, let's say quickly deploys tech to reduce their emissions to only 80 units. Company A can then buy Company B's unnecessary credits. So long as the cost is less than the would-be fine for Company A, this makes sense for both parties. Regardless of who they pay for credits, obviously Company A would prefer not to have to do this at all. So there is continued incentive for Company A to address their emissions. Now, of course, this is a super duper simplified explanation. As with all things climate, the devil is in the detail, and the real world application of carbon trading is far more complex. Another option for assessing carbon credits in a trade situation is that, let's say, Company A approaches a forested landowner who is possibly interested in a deforestation and animal agricultural project. If Company A can pay them on a perpetual basis while they deploy emissions reductions tech, it's in the best interest of both parties to leave the land healthily growing carbon capturing forest. Buying carbon credits is mandatory in the case where a company will exceed their carbon cap, and that's the difference between credits and offsets, the latter being voluntary. A carbon reduction project generates carbon credits, and when someone then buys it to offset their own emissions from air travel or just from their general lifestyle, that's carbon offsetting. As they gain popularity, they're popping up all over the place. Demand equals supply. And while that's really good, in theory, people wishing to buy offsets still need to carry out fairly extensive research to know that these projects are what they say they are. Carbon credit projects need to demonstrate that the achieved emission reductions or carbon dioxide removals are real, measurable, permanent, additional, independently verified, and unique. We recommend looking to Gold Standard, Vera, or Green E Climate for certification of projects you'd like to use to offset your carbon emissions. And no worries, we will link those for you below. The carbon market has the potential to continue to increase the speed with which we embrace renewable energies, and it has been shown to incentivize emissions reductions. 
but we still feel strongly that this system should be temporary. The main goal should be to reduce emissions in an absolute sense, not just through trading. What do you think? Let us know in the comments below. Seriously, please don't hesitate. We really do love to open dialogue with you. Well, that's all for today, Swarmers. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you're feeling a little more comfortable with what the carbon market is and does. Oh yeah, one more thing. Don't forget to hit that little bell floating around on this page here somewhere so that you make sure to catch our next videos and you never miss an upcoming piece on how to live your most sustainable life. We love you, Swarmers. See you next time.